uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to, to speak here. And uh, I think it's great that there's this wonderful series of workshops uh, uh, commemorating Tut's centenary going on around the, the world. It's just a bit of a shame that they all happen in the same year. So uh, for the last few of these meetings, Carolyn Chen and I have done a kind of double act where I give a sort of general introduction to Delta Matroids, then she talks about some recent stuff. So because of the schedule change, you're going to have to remember everything I talk about until Carolyn talks tomorrow afternoon. Uh, another consequence of that is that people who are regulars at this meeting will have seen most of what I'm talking about before, and one or two people have probably seen this about five times, so I'm sorry about that. I know for a lot of people it will be new. There are one or two new things in there, and I've put a little bit of a new take on it this year by focusing on excluding minor results. Okay, so let's just start off by remembering what a a delta matroid is, if we recast the definition of a matroid just a little bit in terms of its bases, so in particular, if we take the second axiom there, that is more or less the basis exchange axiom for a matroid, except what I've said is that uh, I can take an element that's in the symmetric difference of two bases and find another element in the symmetric difference of the two bases and kind of flip them with respect to the first basis and get another basis. Now, of course, that might create a problem if both of those elements are in B1 or they're both in B2. I'll end up with something having a uh, different size from what I started with. So to really make sure I've got a matroid, I just add in the condition that all the bases have got the same size. So Boucher introduced delta matroids in the 1980s. And what they are is, well, you take the first two parts of the definition from above and you throw away the fact that all the bases have to be the same size. So if you want to keep an intuitive idea of what a delta matroid is through this talk, just think about a matroid, but somehow we're allowing the bases to have different sizes. And just to stress in that definition, I'm allowed to take E equal to F, and so that will mean in particular that uh, bases, or feasible sets as we call them in, in delta matroids, could have sizes of different parity. Okay, so what's the most basic thing you can say about uh, delta matroids? Well, clearly from the definition, every matroid is a delta matroid. Second thing you get very easily from the definition is if you look at the feasible sets that are the smallest size, they give you a matroid. If you look at the feasible sets of the largest size, they also give you the bases of a matroid. All right, so what I want to do is look at um, some classes of, of delta matroids. That's really what I'm going to look at today. And the first one I'll start with is uh, these delta matroids that you get from symmetric binary matrices. So we have a, a symmetric binary matrix up there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a collection of feasible sets from it by taking non-singular principal submatrices. So what do I mean by that? So a, a principal submatrix I get by selecting a subset of the labels of the rows and columns, so the same subset of rows, the same subset of columns, and look at where they, they intersect in the, in the matrix. So for instance, one, two, I'm saying is a feasible set, and that's if I take this the first and second row, first and second column, I get this submatrix here, and that's non-singular, so that's going to be a feasible set. On the other hand, if I take one, two, three, that would mean taking the first three columns, first three rows, and that is not, uh, well, that, that is singular, so that's not a feasible set. Okay, so that gives me a collection of uh, feasible sets. And Boucher proves that that gives me a delta matroid. Now, to define binary matroids, uh, delta matroids, uh, absolutely properly, I need to introduce first operation that I'm going to have on delta matroids, and that's a twist. So it's a very easy idea. I take my delta matroid, and I take a subset of the elements and I take all the collection of feasible sets and I form their symmetric differences with, with this set A. So that gives me the twist. The literature is usually called the twist. I'm going to call it the partial dual. You'll see why that is later on. A couple of reasons for that, but I'm going to call this a partial dual. So uh, this gives me a new delta matroid. Easy to see that's a new delta matroid. If I took A to be the whole set E and D was a matroid, I'd have taken the, the dual of the, the matroid. Okay, so um, Boucher then defined binary delta matroids to be the partial duals of, of those that I just showed you on the previous slide. 
And one reason why you might want to do that is that, uh, well, we have the convention that the empty set is always a feasible set in the, what we did on the previous slide. So unless I do this, I've always got the empty set as a feasible set in my delta matroid. And this gives me a bit more flexibility. Um, not too difficult to see every binary matroid. It's a binary delta matroid. And now can define representability or representable delta matroids over arbitrary fields. Um, there are different definitions of this in the literature. There's all sorts of various combinations of things that you can do. But um, I'm going to stick with this one, because it's what I need for the things I want to talk about. Uh, so I'm going to say it's F representable if it's a partial dual of something we got as we uh, formed on the previous slide. Only my matrix can have entries from this field F, and it's got to be either symmetric or skew symmetric. So start with a a matrix of entries from F, skew symmetric or symmetric, and do just what I did on the previous slide, and then maybe take a partial dual. And that's going to give me an F representable delta matroid. OK. So, some more operations. Deletion and contraction. So they work exactly as they do for a matroid, if you phrase things in terms of the bases. So, first of all, we could define a co-loop, something in every feasible set. Loop, something that's in no feasible set. And then I delete something that's not a co-loop by just throwing away the, the bases that uh, contain that element. I uh, contract something that's not a loop by taking the bases that do contain that element and then removing that element from them. And then I get, if I'm a co-loop or a loop, I just uh, say that the two things, the deletion and contraction, are the same, and that fills in all the gaps. OK. And then various nice things happen, like the order of deletions and contractions doesn't matter. And I can define a minor by saying that uh, anything I can get from a delta matroid by deleting or contracting arbitrary sets of elements, I'll call that a minor. OK. So here's just a very quick example. If that's my delta matroid, so those are the feasible sets, so they're like the bases. If I contract one, well, I've got one feasible set that contains one. So I retain that, but I remove one from it. And I've got two feasible sets, so that gives me the contraction. And I've got two feasible sets that don't contain one, so I just keep them. And that gives me the deletion. OK. All right, so something Boucher proved was uh, he managed to find the excluded minors for binary delta matroids. And up to partial duals, there are five of them. So the excluding minors are all these delta matroids and their partial duals. So this generalizes Tut's characterization of binary matroids. And this one here, this one here is a, a partial dual of U24. In some ways, so this proof is quite similar to Tut's proof, but it's, it's also I think in some ways it's actually a little bit simpler, and, um, a little easier to see where it comes from, perhaps, than, than Tut's proof. But it's, uh, Tut's proof is probably more elegant at the same time. OK, so we've got binary delta matroids. Maybe the next class of matroids that we might try to think about is, is regular matroids. Can we say something uh, equivalent or something like that for, for delta matroids? And so this is, all comes from a paper of uh, Jim Geelan. Uh, so we'll say that a, an integral square matrix is principally unimodular. If every principal submatrix is determinant minus 1, 0, or 1. So that's kind of generalizing in some sense, or taking the equivalent of being totally unimodular, where you would have that every square submatrix has got determinant minus 1, 0, or 1. And we'll say a delta matroid is equable if it can be represented by a symmetric matrix as one of these principally union modular ones. So Jim had two uh, theorems on this. So this first one is very similar to results for regular matroids. These three conditions are given there are equivalent, so they're equable or that can be represented over every field by a symmetric matrix, or that can be represented over both GF2 and GF3 by a symmetric matrix. 
And we also have the excluded minors. I haven't shown them there, but the excluded minors for being equable. So they're the five excluded minors that I showed you for binary delta matroids, and another five binary delta matroids, including, um, including the Fano and all their partial duals. OK, so um, move on to another class of delta matroids, which, are, which is where I came to delta matroids from and how we got to thinking about them. And uh, it's been very useful because ribbon graphs are things where there's been a lot of study in the last few years, and this has actually guided us into proving some results about delta matroids that we might not have thought about otherwise. So ribbon graphs, we don't want to get too technical with the definition. Um, those are pictures of ribbon graphs, topological objects of disks, vertices, ribbons for edges. What I'm really thinking about is the cyclic order around each vertex that the, the edges meet each vertex. And they are equivalent up to doing things like twisting around the, the graph and so on, as long as the, the orientation cyclic order around each um, vertex remains the same. So the key objects in graphs, when we think about matroids, are the spanning trees. In delta matroids, they are the quasi-trees. And those are spanning subgraphs where the boundary has only one component. And let me show you with an example what I mean. So here's a ribbon graph, and here is its delta matroid. So if I take, for instance, just AB, so the three vertices together with AB would be a, a spanning tree. And if I trace around this, so I walk around the edge of the subgraph that I've got. And if I do that, what I've done is I've walked around the whole of the edge of the subgraph in one go. On the other hand, if I do A, B, C, D, so I come around the, around the bottom, go inside C now, around the inside of B, and where have I gone? I've gone wrong. Let's try again. I come along the top, around here, around the inside of B, the inside. Oh, maybe I was right. I was right. Yes, yeah, sorry. Around the top of D, down the bottom of C, and around back to the top. So I've been around everything. On the other hand, if I took, for example, ABE, so that's the triangle, then the triangle's got an inside and an outside, so I can't walk around all the boundary in one go. So that's what the quasi trees are. And so, yeah, simple example, spanning tree is always a quasi tree, so that's why it's generalizing graphs. Boucher proved that the quasi trees form the feasible sets of a delta matroid, and a little bit more, that uh, if the ribbon graph can be embedded in an orientable surface, then the, the sizes of all the feasible sets have the same parity. And we call those delta matroids even delta matroids. All right, so what about deletion and uh, contraction in ribbon graphs? Well, deletion works exactly as it does in a graph, you just delete. Contraction, what you do there is you preserve the boundary walks. So let me give you one quick example. So here, if I were to contract this orientable loop, well, the boundary walk starting at the top left would come around, and, and so come down here around the loop and go down the bottom left, something similar on the other side. So the only way that that can happen is if I actually split this vertex into two. And so that is the contraction. Okay. Now, second operation on graphs, partial duality. I'm not going to say much about this other than, so this is generalizing duality, normal duality of embedded graphs. And this is saying I can form duals by taking the dual with respect to an edge or a subset of the edges one by one. Okay, so for example, this, um, whoops, wrong button. This edge here is replaced, this edge here is replaced by an orientable loop. And so here's a quick example graph, those three edges. These are its partial duals up to isomorphism, very different types of graphs, very different genus, all that kind of thing. OK, so um, good thing is that deletion and contraction in ribbon graphs, 
that corresponds to deletion and contraction in delta matroids, partial duals of ribbon graphs, and delta matroids correspond, so they're the same things. So this is one reason for using the partial dual name. Um, so corollary of Boucher's result binary delta matroids that every ribbon graphic delta matroid is binary. And then there's this really nice result of Gielen and Um finding the excluded minors for the class of ribbon graphic delta matroids. So we have the five excluded minors for binary and then another 166 binary delta matroids and all of their partial duals. Okay, so here's another. Yeah, Paul. You take the you take the quasi trees, so the the one face subgraphs. Okay, so here's another quick class of delta matroids. Um, so if I take the partial duals of a matroid, uh, of matroids, that gives me a minor closed class, and it's not too difficult to find the. This is an early result, Duchamp, to find the excluded minors being a partial dual of a matroid. You can take this a little bit further. So if we take the width of a delta matroid to be the difference in size between its largest and smallest feasible sets. So class of delta matroids which have a partial dual of width at most k, it's closed under minors. And last summer, um, around about the time of this meeting last year, we, uh, Creel was visiting us and we found the excluded minors for width one. And this result, Comes, basically comes from considering the, the ribbon graphs. So Ian Moffat had been working a lot on partial duals of ribbon graphs and had an equivalent result for ribbon graphs and that pointed us in the right direction. And it was, we wouldn't, but we would never, I don't think, have ever thought about this result or how to do it with, if we weren't guided by the ribbon graphs. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is another operation that you can do on a ribbon graph. So simple thing you could do with a ribbon graph is just put a twist, half twist in an edge. And you could put half twist in an arbitrary set of edges. Let's just keep that in mind for a minute, but do something different. Let's look at binary uh, matrices. Something you might want to do is you might want to flip a diagonal entry from a 0 to a 1. Oops. Yeah, there we go. Or the other way. And we can do that to any set of elements on the diagonal. So Breda and Hudeboom were thinking about binary delta matroids, and they Considering this operation, they were motivated by some problem in DNA sequencing or reconstruction, and I'm not, I don't remember exactly how that works, but uh, they were very interested in this operation, and they managed to show what this does to the delta matroid. They worry about what it actually says, but they were able to do that. And at the same time, or a little bit later, we were thinking of what the twisting, half-twisting operation does in a, in a ribbon graph. And again, don't worry about the details of what this says, but it does the same thing. So it's the same, same operation on the delta matroid, which was a little surprising, although you can see why that might happen when I think about it a little more. So that leads us to a class of delta matroids I'd like to understand a little more, which is the VS safe delta matroids. So what we could try to do is to extend this operation to all delta matroids. Could we, so this, um, do uh, form a new set of feasible sets, just like in that rule, which was on the previous slide. Problem is that in general, this doesn't give you a delta matroid. And so we can form the class of delta matroids which are closed under partial duals and this, this operation, which we'll call loop complementation, it's a new operation. So they're called VF safe. And it's a minor closed class. We don't know what the excluded minors are or even really have any clue about whether there's even a finite number. Looking at small examples suggests there are lots and lots of them, but it's, it's, it's all very unclear. So that's a question I'd like to understand. Something else that just kind of finished last year, which I mentioned actually in the conference last year, I haven't said this is who this is due to because 95% of the work was done by Breda and Hugeboom, and then with um, Gordon Royal and René Pivotal, we were thinking about something else, and we realized that what we were doing enabled us to complete the last step in this proof that the class of matroids, all matroids are delta matroids, so they're VS safe if and only if they have none of these minors. And this is a class kind of quite closely related to quaternary matroids that have been, been very well studied. So very last thing. Um, so if we think of how the operations of doing one loop complementation, one partial dual 
and maybe a sequence of those but on the same edge, how do they work? Well, they, they it's work like two transmissions in S3. So I get potentially six different delta matroids by doing a, a, uh, a sequence of these things. And in particular, on a particular edge, they, they don't commute. So what we'll say is we'll say that if I can get from D to D dashed by doing an arbitrary sequence of these things with potentially many different edges, then I'll say one is a twisted dual of the other. And the second thing is if I think of the deletion, you can easily check that if I, the deletion is the same as doing a partial dual and then contracting, well, this suggests that maybe we could come up with a third minor operation when it's, it may not always be defined, where I do the loop complementation and then I contract. And so all of these things are, um, all of these things, sorry, let me skip that for a moment. All of these things are nicely defined. Everything works in the way you'd want it to work for minors, all fine. Let's suppose, though, we want to try to do this on an arbitrary set system. So rather than having the bases of a matroid or the feasible sets of a delta matroid, I've just got a bunch of sets. So all these things are defined. You may not get something nice. You lose that the order of the operations um, doesn't, doesn't matter. But you still get a well-defined set of minors. You can think of all the possible minors you can get from these things. And so very recently what we've shown is that although we can't really say very much at the moment about what the excluded minors are for um, VF safe delta matroids, if we want a set system to be both VF safe, VF, to be a VF safe delta matroid, then it is, it, that's so if and only if it contains no three minor, so a minor where we can do these, these three operations, um, isomorphic to a twisted dual, of this, this one excluded minor. So that's a sort of partial result in the, the way um, we'd like to get. And Carolyn is, this kind of will make, perhaps make more sense after Carolyn's talk tomorrow, but she's going to talk about some things which are related to this idea of doing minor operations on, on set systems. So I will stop there and um, just ask for, ask for questions. So are there questions? I was uh, actually just wondering out of sheer vanity whether the, uh, your result about VF matroids, did that use, the, yeah, this result that was very similar to the GF4 excluded minus. Did you use the excluded minus? Um, so not, no, not quite. So this, um, so ooh, where are we? Uh, so at some point, uh, all right, where have we gone? Yeah, right. So at some point, Breda and Hugerman have proved that every GF4 representable um, matroid was, was VF safe. And then this class is considered in the paper, I think, or a later. It's, very, it's, this, that, it's what you get by, isn't it, uh, taking um, uh, matroids that come from some Steiner system and doing two and three sums or something like that. No, not three sums, just two sums, right? So they had checked all these things but they weren't sure how to do a two-sum or how to prove that the two property. And that was the last thing that we were able to do from things that were going on. So it was all kind of there for us to just finish off this last step. So, yeah.